In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I'm in the beginning of doing some marriage counseling for a couple. And it's been a long time since I was ordained. I don't know how many couples I've done marriage counseling for, but it's been plenty. And I have to say, after all these years, I have a marriage counseling strategy that I'm pretty proud of. There's just this one part of it, and it's actually, unfortunately, the very first session, the very first question that I ask couples when they're preparing for ma uh, marriage that just doesn't seem to work that well. And I don't understand why this question doesn't work well, because it is right there in my pastoral clinical education book under marriage counseling. So it should be a ringer. And besides that, the question is not complicated. It's really simple. I ask couples as they begin to prepare for marriage, so why this person? I have asked older couples this question, younger couples this question, gay couples, straight couples, couples who have fascinating lives, couples who have ordinary lives, couples who have had to make huge sacrifices to be together, golden couples who have all of the familial support and the financial security they could possibly need to go off and live happily ever after. The circumstances just do not seem to change the answers that any couple, no matter what they're like, give to this question. There are probably, I don't know, six to eight answers that I've heard over and over again. He loves her because she's so kind. She loves him because he's funny. They love each other because they are always looking forward to seeing each other at the end of the day. And it goes on like that. And none of those answers are bad. That's not my complaint. My complaint is that no matter who the couple is, where they're from, and what they're like, these are the same answers I always get. They could actually be answers about any couple regardless of who they are. And the thing that's weird about this is I don't learn anything in particular about couples when they share these answers with me. And strangely, I know from personal experience, love is not generic, it's extremely specific. You love the people you love in a very specific way. So why is it so hard to say something new about why we love the people we love that doesn't sound like it's right off the front of a Hallmark card. After getting nowhere with this question yet again in my current situation with a couple who I'm counseling for marriage, I decided it's time I finally have to ask myself the question I've been asking all of these couples for so many years. Why do I love the people I love? What makes him special? Why her or why him? The same generic answers came to mind. And I don't know whether you think you could do better, but I'm going to give you an opportunity to test this out. Think about somebody that you really love for a few seconds. I'll give you a few seconds to think about the person who you want to hone in on. Doesn't matter who it is, but somebody who you really love. Do you have the image of that person in your mind? So probably when you look at that image in your mind of that person that you love or recall their voice, you find that you have a physical reaction of some kind. It might be that your chest opens up a bit or the way you're breathing changes. Maybe it slows down. Maybe it speeds up. You might actually find yourself smiling 
And if you're not smiling, your face muscles might be twitching a little bit as if they were about to smile. So, okay. Now try just in your mind to wrap words around why you love this person. See what I mean? I'm pretty sure that if you were in this room with me and you answered the question, you would say this. The person you love is kind. The person you love is beautiful. The person you love is thoughtful. The person you love is funny. Whatever anyone else would agree with, uh, wh and whether anyone else would agree with you about those things, whether they, other people think they're kind or other people think they're funny or other people think they're beautiful, there's a way that it's even better for you if other people don't see it. Because that person that you love is somehow some kind of secret garden that is a place that you go to all alone that nobody else knows the way to. And that's what your love feels like. So it, sometimes it makes it even more special to you. And then there's the even less helpful reasons for the purpose of explaining to anyone else the reasons why you love the people that you love. There are things that are really bizarre, like the person you love just smells right. Their laugh is contagious, whatever that means. You love how their eyes twinkle when they're about to tell a joke. Yeah, I know. I know all about that because we have something in common. My mother, my partner, my children, my brother, my best friends are exactly like that too. Even though none of the people I love are anything like the people that you love. Last night, I was reading a rabbi's blog about the Shema, which, as I mentioned in the children's sermon, is the prayer that Jews recite every morning and every evening. The first part of the Shema is, as I said to the kids, this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom forever and ever. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your might. About the love of God or human beings, this rabbi whose blog I was reading said, if you can explain why it is you love somebody, Probably it isn't love. I'm going to say that again because it was a big deal to me. If you can explain why it is that you love somebody, chances are good it isn't love. And for me, that was it. You can't accurately describe love as if it was some particular species of bird or some geographical region because love is something that is beyond reasoning. The more I think about it, love is even, in its essence, something that's unreasonable. And that's why the lawyer who asks Jesus, teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest in the Gospel of Matthew? is kind of trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. Which law in the commandment is the greatest? This lawyer is not a civil lawyer the way we understand it today. This, this lawyer is a scholar of rabbinic law. And there are 613 laws in the Torah and what this lawyer is looking for is a good, legal, well-reasoned wrestling match with Jesus, who is a teacher, about Jewish law. 
When Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, and then follows it up with, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is not saying anything new. The law about loving God, as I said, the first, the first verse of the Shema is in Deuteronomy. And the law about loving one's neighbor as oneself is in Leviticus. So what Jesus is telling this lawyer is kosher, so to speak. But he says, and this is the thing that twists it all around at the end, Jesus says, anyone who just obeys these two laws, loving God with all your heart, mind, and your strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself, winds up, as a result, obeying all of the 611 laws that are left, and even obeying the words of the prophets. And when Jesus says this, I think in a way, the reasonableness of obeying the law at all costs as the most important thing we owe God seems to fall apart. One of the ways Jesus has been hugely annoying the clergy is by going around and breaking laws, by the way. He's healed a blind man on the Sabbath, and he lets his disciples pick grain in the fields, harvest the fields on the Sabbath because they're hungry. And this is a big deal because the Sabbath prohibits work. It's a day of rest. And there is no way anybody could possibly argue that the rule to obey and keep the Sabbath and not work on the Sabbath is a really good rule. Keeping the Sabbath is a way that human beings are able to remember that they do not belong to their jobs, they do not belong to their masters if they happen to be slaves, they do not belong to their own drive for personal success. The Sabbath is kind of like this bumper that stops us from falling out of relationship with God by acting like we ourselves are, in fact, our own God. By suddenly, just without even thinking about it, figuring out that we're our own ultimate source of life instead of acknowledging that God is the source of all life. So the Sabbath is good. So, but when Jesus equates making the loving God and keeping the Sabbath and, make, and loving God and your neighbor being the same law um, and says that doing those two things are exactly the same thing, what we wind up with is working on the Sabbath for the sake of loving people, actually being a way of keeping the Sabbath. So breaking that rule of keeping the Sabbath by loving someone else becomes a way of keeping the Sabbath. Breaking a rule for the sake of love becomes a way of keeping the rule. And then meanwhile, the clergy in the Gospels who confront Jesus about breaking the Sabbath are actually themselves breaking the rule about the Sabbath and breaking the law. Because when they confront Jesus about his own failure to keep the law, they're not doing it because they want to show their love to God. The reason that they're confronting Jesus about breaking rules is because they want to discredit him. And so they take a law that is about doing what is right and loving. They take the Torah and the 613 laws that are found in it, which are all about loving your God, 
And they make those rules loveless because they weaponize them against Jesus. Love seems to create exceptions to rules all of the time. And it doesn't have a good reason to do it that I can tell except for its own sake. Love is vague about the past wrongs of others, just like Jesus is vague about our own sins and forgives them. Love is something like good art. You just know when you see it in action in the world and you know when you feel it. And the way you know what love is, is it's always the thing that makes room, more room for other people than you would have thought was there to begin with in your own life or in the world or in our country. And it makes room for people in your own heart that you couldn't possibly have imagined welcoming in there to begin with. And every time love makes more room by breaking a law, God is glorified. So brothers and sisters, I invite you to consider this day breaking some laws or breaking some rules of your own to actually keep them and loving your neighbor as yourself. And just know every time you do that, your God weeps for joy. Amen.